Hello and welcome to Sahara TV once again. January 18th, 2014 will remain a day of gloom for many. It is the day when ace journalist Komla Dumont passed on without so much as a private text message hint of what he was going through. The world-renowned journalist who went to the BBC from Ghana's leading media entity, the Multimedia Group, where he was host of Joy FM's Super Morning Show, is survived by a wife and three kids. His death came as a shock to many, and at Joy FM, a life-size banner of him hangs in front of the edifice, perhaps as a reminder of the beginning of his great journey to put Ghana and Africa on the map of top-notch journalism. Tributes have been pouring in from notables, including President John Dramani Mahama and Makaziwe Mandela. A night of music and poetry has also been held for him, where celebrated poet Atukwe Okai read a moving poem in his honor. On the line right now from Ghana to speak with us on why Komla Dumas seems larger than life and what his legacy is to Ghanaian and African journalists is um, his colleague Kojo Opong Nkrumah, who stepped in the hot seat left by Komla Dumont when he left for the BBC. We, we were also built to speak with Israel Lai, but something happened at the last minute and we're still trying to raise him on the line. We will also speak with a close relative of his, Minister of Culture, Tourism and the Creative Arts, Abla Jifa Gomashi, who recently hit the news for saying that Kobla Dumo is larger than Ghana. But for now, let's go to Accra, where we speak with Kojo Opong in Kruma. Welcome to Sahara TV, Kojo. Hi, thank you, and hello to your viewers all over the United States and all over the world. Thank you so much for making time with us. Let me start with you. You have known Kamla for a while now. How did this whole journey begin? How did his journey begin? He was he started out as a traffic reporter with Joy FM. Yes, um, I think um, at the beginning of Kamla's personal journey in broadcasting, he had been, you know, very interested in broadcasting as an individual. At that time, uh, Ghana only had the benefit of a state broadcaster, and he tried his hand there at the state broadcasting corporation as an intern first, hoping to go on there, but he was uh, denied that opportunity because of a lot of bureaucratic reasons. But just around that same time, the airwaves were liberalized, and Ghana had a plethora of private media house, private radio stations, notable among them, Joy FM. And Komlan got that opportunity at Joy FM right in the beginning, first as a traffic reporter, reporting the traffic news on the morning show, and then later as a you know substitute presenter on the morning show. And then eventually he took over the morning show. And when he took over the morning show, he essentially, with you know, the help of his producers and the managers of the station, they redefined uh, the morning show to make it a talk program. Prior to that, it was mostly a music and a social program, but they redefined it to make it a talk program. And it was during those 10 years um, when he was host of that program that he uh, literally redefined uh, broadcasting in Ghana, uh, you know, doing talk radio in a different way, bringing the issues that mattered to people but were never seeing the limelight to the forefront. Mm. Uh, and being a voice for many who felt disenfranchised or who felt silenced, and essentially taking on the establishment, and that's how come he became such um, a figure that many, many people grew up listening to and became so fond of here in Ghana over those 10 years until he left for the BBC. Oh, fantastic. Um, you've actually said something that's very instructive and, and relates to the next question I was going to ask you. He, his name was actually synonymous with the with um, Super Morning Show, and many have said that he actually pushed that show to where it is today. Would you agree to that? I very much agree um, uh, with that assessment. Like I said, prior to his taking over the show, it was a very relaxed, music-driven show. But when he took over, himself, his producers, the managers of the station turned it around to make it a current affairs talk magazine program, taking on everyday issues of health, of uh, maternal uh, mortality, of uh, corruption, of governance of business of you know the daily things that go to the heart of everybody's life and it was through that that uh, as i mentioned a radio was redefined in Ghana. Mm. Yes, indeed um a lot of tributes keep pouring in and samuel atta mesa of ctfm uh said of him komla was the art and science of radio 
And he also says he, he broke the rules to, to define the rules. Uh, I mean, what kind of person was Komla? He seems larger than life when we hear his, his eulogies. What kind of person was he? So I'm very right in this assessment um, of him. And as you have probably heard, many other persons you know, pay their tributes uh, in different ways. Essentially, you know, what Komla represented was a redefining of the order. Like I mentioned, prior to his coming onto the scene, we had the state broadcaster that did everything by the book. But, you know, in those early years when Kamala and his colleagues took over the radio, um, they brought a new style, they brought a new approach, they, they, they did things that had never been done before, they, they asked questions that had never been asked before, they mm. challenged the status quo. Mm. And it is, it is, it is, it is by so doing, that he etched an indelible mark in the minds and the hearts of many. Um, you know, it is very similar to uh, freedom fighters or um, independent heads of state who are able to fight for independence for country. They are able to change the old order. And that's why he remains in the hearts and the minds of many across the continent today. That, yes, indeed. Um, can I ask you, what are your fondest memories of him? My fondest memories of him were you know, built over a period during which I worked with him as a co-presenter on the morning show before he left for the BBC. And there was a period during which um, I must admit we didn't necessarily have um, a lot of a personal conversation, but just by watching him and listening to him and seeing how he went about his science and his art in the studio, she could learn a lot about what to do and what not to do as a young journalist. Indeed, I know many other people who, just by listening over the radio, learned a lot from him and who decided to take up their, um, uh, the profession of journalism. But for me, as I have, like many others, grieved over the last one week, my thoughts really go to that one week period during which I worked with him on Joy FM Super Morning Show, watching him work, seeing how he'll do the things behind the scenes and yet how he'll come on air and shake off his you know, worries or insecurities or, you know, maybe lack of information, but manage on air to handle it very professionally and work as well, uh, through which those are my fondest memories of him. Okay. So, in 2003, he was voted the Journalist of the Year. However, technically speaking, he, he was not a journalist at that point because a lot of people said he was, you know, he hadn't been to journalism school, et cetera, et cetera. He still rose above all that criticism and, and shamed his, his detractors, if you will, by landing a really good job with the BBC. You know how this came mm -hmm. about? Well, um, essentially, when the Ghana Journalist Association voted him as Journalist of the Year, those who had studied journalism in school, who thought that they were the only ones who qualified to be called journalists, raised issues with it. It, you know, it became a big debate mm -hmm. as to who a journalist was. Um, it, uh, is a journalist the one who's practicing it, or is he the one who's gone through a journalism institution with a certificate to show for it? But I think the test uh, really was about the work, and it is his work that spoke for him that eventually, in spite of all the criticisms uh, that he may have faced at the time, it still spoke for him even from his very last days. His work spoke for itself. Mm, okay. I'm just curious, though, this is a, a bit, you know, um, it's related, though, but it's still a bit of an aside. When he was uh, the host of the Super Morning Show, he also compared the, the presidential debates. After he left for the BBC, you took that, that job at, the, at Joy FM, and you also took the, you know, the seat for comparing the the presidential debates, is that a given? Is it like the Super Morning Show host is automatically the compare for the presidential debates? No, 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 not at all. What uh, happens in Ghana is that when the presidential debates are near, uh, uh, the contending parties themselves nominate broadcasters who they respect and who they think are of a certain pedigree and stature that um, you know, can handle the presidential debates. And uh, during his day, um, he was nominated by the various contending parties. I was also privileged uh, to be nominated by the contending parties. Mm. It just happens to be a coincidence. But I think if there's a relation, it would be in the quality of uh, training that you get at Joy FM. Yeah. 
quality of training you get at Joy FM and the kind of um, uh, independence and confidence that is instilled in you at Joy FM empowers you to do your job in a particular manner. And no wonder, you know, people, people will look at it at the end of the day and nominate you uh, for such, such, such platforms. Okay. He was called the boss player. You know how he got that nickname? Yeah. I don't know. I think it's a name that he loved as well. Uh, I grew up listening to him. At that time, I was in um, junior high school. Um, that was my first time of hearing him. I was in junior high school. I grew up listening to him. Uh, I grew up knowing the name. I honestly don't know how it came about. Uh, but it was a name that he also loved very much. Okay. All right. Now, let me ask you, uh, you know, again, you, you obviously didn't work with him too long because I think by the time you got to Joy FM, he was actually on his way out. Um, sure. is, there a, is there a relation between Joy FM and the BBC? Because there's quite a, 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 you know, a number of Joy FM you know, presenters working with the BBC now. Is there a link? Well, um, like I said, I think it's in the training that you get at Joy FM. It brings out the best in you. So when the BBC is shopping for talents all over Africa, no wonder Joy FM becomes a hotbed for them to find a lot of good talent. That's why you see a lot of people, uh, you know, who worked at Joy FM find themselves at the BBC. But um, in times past, um, when Joy FM started broadcasting, we had a formal relationship with the BBC where we take some of their programs uh, live on air, like the Focus on Africa and BBC News at 7 a.m. on the Super Morning Show. Uh, so, yes, there is a formal relationship, but that relationship doesn't extend to necessarily providing staff for them. I think the link is in the quality of people that JFM produces, and that's how come you find some of these people, I could see Sapon, um, you know, and a few other persons finding their way up to the BBC, just like Comrade did as well. Okay. Now, a, a lot of people have also associated his death with the pressure of the job. How, how, how bad is it? How really, you know, pressuring is a job like that? From your own experience, I'm not in a position to say whether or not indeed his death is associated with um, the pressures of the job. I'm sure that as a pathologist and uh, the other associated persons complete their job in the UK, they can, you know, give a proper determination. But if you ask me about the pressures of the job, um, anybody who has been associated with media, with particularly breakfast shows, knows that it's a very demanding schedule. Um, from, you know, waking up times to the kind of research and work that you have to put into it uh, to times when you have to go uh, to bed. Now, you add that to a developing African economy where there's a lot of suspicion, especially of, uh, um, you know, journalists and broadcasters, there is a lot of pressure, but you do want to manage that pressure in your own stride. Okay. Now, finally, yesterday there was, um, or was it the day before, there was a, a memorial held for Komla by multimedia. Can you give us a brief um, gist on what happened at the event? Well, it was last night, actually, at the forecourt of uh, multimedia, where um, Komla, you know, stood and parked his car and, you know, had a lot of evenings sitting and chatting with friends. And essentially what, uh, what the group did was to honor his memory by bringing together you know, some of the old colleagues that he had worked with about uh, 18 years ago or in the last 18 years, uh, you know, to essentially tell their own stories of what they knew of him and uh, what their experiences had been over the years. It was also a night of poetry and music, um, a night for a multimedia group to say thank you to him for his dedication and service and to celebrate him for what he had done uh, as a professional over the last two decades. Okay. I said finally, but let me add a, a little extra on the side. <laughs> People are calling for a state funeral for him. You think he deserves a state funeral? I think he deserves a state funeral. He's uh, been a, a, a very, very good ambassador for Ghana on the world stage. And um, if the state finds it worthy to you know, accord various other persons um, that final honor, I think this is one gentleman who deserves it. Kojo Opong Nkrumah, your time is well deserved with us. Thank you so much. All the best, my brother. Okay, thank you. Viewers, that was Kojo Opong Nkrumah, who stepped into Komla Dumas' shoes at Joy 99.5 FM. We're also built to speak with Abla Jifa Gomashi, Minister of Tourism, Culture, and the Creative Arts, who also happens to be a cousin of Komla Dumas. We'll be back in a few minutes with that interview.